It's the country's number one RVing radio show, sponsored by RVTravel.com, with your host, Alan Warren, the RV wingman. And we are rolling along, folks, with our after-the-show show, show, where we are not uh, restrained, as they say, by network commercial breaks. We get a chance to really dig into some topics with some really smart guests, guests that will help level the playing field between the RV industry and the consumer that's you and me. I am Alan Warren, the RV wingman. I invite you to join us every single week for topics that you will most likely, well, you won't hear anybody else talking about. Make sure you like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and turn your notifications on. So, whenever the uh, subject of lemon RVs comes up, many in the RV industry, they're like, uh, you know, even some RVers, they go, give it up, wingman, give it up. Enough already. Well, here's the deal. While the majority of RVs out there may not be lemons, if you have one, you are in a living hell, an expensive, not just financially expensive, but emotionally costly nightmare, a nightmare that could quite literally bankrupt you. It could. So if you don't want to hear what's going on in the real world in terms of what to do if you have a lemon RV, now's a pretty good time to maybe hit that stop button. But if you want to know, If you want to be armed with the knowledge of what to do if you have bought a lemon RV, you have come to the right place. And the RV Show USA guest line is a friend of the show who we always learn so much from, our famous RV lemon lawyer, Howdy Ron Burge. Well, good evening. How you doing, Alan? Doing great. You know, we we got a, a short bullet list of things to talk about today in the next half hour or so. I want to get right into it. So for those two or three people out there listening who may not know who Ron Burge is, and what your firm does, what's your 60-second story, Ron? I've been doing this for 40 years. I'm not that old, though. And <laughs> essentially, I help people get rid of bad RVs by making the manufacturer pay money or buy them back. All right, so, so you have been doing this a, an awful long time. When people say that you can't win, you cannot beat the RV manufacturers, uh, that's just not true, is it? No, it isn't true at all. There are some cases where you can't win, but there's a lot of cases where you can. It depends on your particular RV and what they put you through. Well, give me an example, if you would. I I, I know that you had a recent case involving Winnebago. Yeah, I sure did. It was a case that uh, the people just simply were not going to give up until they got what was fair out of it, and Winnebago just wouldn't do it. Uh, so they dragged it out every way they could, uh, Winnebago did. And we finally ended up in front of a jury over in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania last month. And at that point, it took one week to do the trial. And at the end of it, Winnebago learned why you're better off not going in a courtroom on these things. So what what was the story? I mean, are you able to talk about it or no? Oh, no, I can talk about it. In fact, it's it's... It was a wonderful couple. They were not all that old, really. They, they were sort of middle-aged, I guess you'd say. But he had a debilitating disease that was not going to get be getting better. And so he had to medically retire. And she decided that this was the time that they had been planning for for almost a decade. And they would just, instead of waiting until they retired at a later age, they decided they would both just retire, sell their home, buy an RV, and spend a year being together and traveling across the country while he was still able to do that. And instead of traveling across the country, seeing all the sights and enjoying the life they expected to have with their brand new RV, they basically went from one dealer to another getting things fixed. They had chances to see things, but the problem was what they saw an awful lot of was a lot of dealerships and a lot of service managers that they got to know and never wanted to meet. What, what kinds of things were wrong? Was it a brand-new RV? It was a brand-new RV, cost them $130,000, and the RV started off with problems they didn't even know existed before they bought it that the dealer worked on. And then there were problems when they literally within days of when they picked it up, it started being worked on. And then they kept getting promises that things would be taken care of and things would be fixed. And by the time they got to the last stop, it was a situation where – New problems came up, old problems returned, and things just never got totally fixed. And it was one thing after another after another. But probably the biggest problem was this is a three-slide-out RV, and one big long slide on one side just decided to stop working. 
and it was a known problem that the manufacturer was aware of. How long from the time they bought it, I mean, how long ago did they buy it? I guess I'm wondering, how long did they have to do, go through this fight, this living hell, if you will, of uh, fighting to get justice on, on a Lemon RV? From the day they bought it to the day they ended up in a courtroom and a jury took care of the case was just about three years. Oh. And when the jury took care of the case, they made that three-year travel through the court system well worthwhile for them, and hopefully a lesson Winnebago and others will learn of. Three years. I can, I can only. And how long did you work on this? I mean, because because there's a lot of documentation before you'll even take a case, right? I mean, yeah, but I I worked on the case probably two years, just about two years, because they came to see me just before their warranty ran out, trying trying to give up on uh, kind of giving up on the factory and the dealers ever getting everything right when the slide out uh, totally failed. And basically, at that point, there was nothing to do except give up, and the factory would no longer take care of things for them to make it all get fixed right. And they were living in this Winnebago. They didn't have a home anymore. This was a full-time situation. Yeah, they were full-timers, and actually, that was one of the arguments Winnebago made to the jury. They said that they were living in it now. It, it, it had become their residence, and therefore, they ought not to have to cover it because these kinds of RVs aren't supposed to be lived in full-time even though they weren't living in it, they were traveling in it. And when you're traveling in an RV full-timing, you're living out of it, but it's not like parking it and making a full-time house out of it. Okay, was the dealer a part of the lawsuit or just Winnebago? No, the dealer was not. They had bought it in New York, and although the dealer had done some things, the, the reality of it was that their problems were the RV itself and all of the defects that it had that just went from one thing to another to another to another. But at the end of that last day of the trial, the jury came back with a unanimous verdict in two hours. I've never had, in all these years, I've never had a jury do a verdict on one of these cases inside two hours, not even close to it. And they didn't have a single question, and I've never had a case where the jury didn't send at least one question out wanting to know about something. This wow. jury pretty well made up their mind, and when they came back and the verdict was read, my clients, they just started crying. They, they, they were just stunned at what the jury decided was necessary to be done to Winnebago. Were, were there ever any attempts by Winnebago to settle this before it went to uh, trial? You know, because a lot of times, they're, they're, th most of the time, things settle before they go to a jury trial. Did they try to settle? That part's not on the public record, oh. um, so I'm not sure I can talk about that, but I can, I can tell you that um, all these people ever wanted and what the factory never was willing to give them was to get rid of this RV and get their money back. That that was a $130,000 RV with financing and everything. If they went all the way to the end alone, it was going to be like 286000 It would end up costing them, but a jury decided that that was enough and they gave him a $500,000 verdict. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so, but sometimes during... You, sometimes it's worth fighting. So, hang on. So, so principles for, or anything else. For the three years, though, that they were in RV hell, were they having to make payments on this thing, payments and insurance? Where did they live? I mean, and there, I've got other things I want to ask you, but I'm just going three years. I mean, you got to be committed. you got to be dedicated to this thing oh yeah you do you have to you have to have the guts to stick it out knowing you're right and the willingness to keep fighting now I, I think the rv industry counts on people not having the guts to stick it all the way through and so they end up sticking it to you the only way that you can break even in one of these bad rv cases is you just keep fighting until the factory gives up and decides okay that's enough Wow. Okay. So, so uh, I, I do have a question. Uh, you said that they, they purchased the RV in New York State. They live in Pennsylvania. When you sue somebody, uh, a, a, a manufacturer, in this case, uh, if, you, if you, they had to sue the dealer, would they have to sue them where the dealer sold it to them or in the state where they reside? Well, it, it depends. A lot of these warranties say that you have to sue in the state where the factory is. Uh, the Winnebago warranty, uh, it has a clause saying you ought to sue in Iowa. There are some others that don't have anything in them, and so you can sue wherever you bought it. 
Uh, I always look at it as Indiana is the backyard of the RV industry. And as far as I'm concerned, I want to sue them in their backyard so they know that we're not afraid to go out back there and show them what they're, what they're made of here. All right. So uh, last time we visited, you mentioned that one RV manufacturer seemed to be doing something or at least kind of beginning to move in the right direction. Do you recall mentioning that? We didn't go into any, any detail. Oh, yeah. But you want to tell us who it is and what kind of what you were seeing? I was hearing uh, reports that uh, Thor had gone the extra mile in a number of cases and had actually changed some procedures and changed some of their manufacturing processes, including some of their inspection processes that made it more difficult for a bad RV to actually come out of the factory. Uh, and I had high hopes that that was going to keep going. Uh, now, that's not any of what I call the Thor children, all these different companies that they bought along the way. That's literally Thor Ludicrous uh, that I'm talking about. Um, and then Thor decided to take a different track, so to speak, uh, that we saw recently where now when you uh, do a registration of your warranty, they actually have slipped in something that takes away more of your legal rights than they've ever taken away before. It's just getting really ridiculous out there. Uh, explain that to me. Well, they're, they're, they are the first to do this. I haven't seen anybody else do it. This is yet. Thor you're talking about. Yeah, okay. and a lot of these manufacturers, they have a warranty registration form that they want you to sign off on when you get your, your RV. Uh, and a lot of those forms, they, they don't say anything terribly important other than you bought the RV. But you've got to read the form carefully. Because a lot of them also say that you are admitting that you have read the warranty and you've gotten the owner's manual and, and all kinds of other stuff, when in reality, that's not what normally happens. But what we just saw on Thor's is really new. On the registration form that we saw, they actually had a jury waiver clause so that if you do sue them, you don't get to have a jury of your peers decide who's right and wrong. Instead, you get one single judge who has heard these cases time and time again and frankly i always believe that a jury is the difference between justice and the law you can have all the law you want but if you want justice i really think you need to have a jury listening to it and making the call going back to your uh, your victory there in harrisburg pennsylvania were you able to ask the jurors if they owned an rv or have they ever been in an rv that yeah, we did, actually. Oh. Uh, we did ask them as we were uh, going through what they call void deer, which is where you ask the, the possible jurors questions at the beginning yeah. so that you can weed out anybody who's biased. And actually, roughly about a fourth of them had RV experience either themselves or with their family or with friends, and so they knew a little bit about RVs, uh, which was a little bit of a surprise. Um, there was one in particular. In fact, there were several who had had bad histories of RVs, um, but uh, they didn't really get to sit on the jury because somebody decided they were going to excuse them. Mm, I uh, wonder who. <laughs> All right, yeah, so you, you can wonder. <laughs> it wasn't me. But, you know, that's the way it goes sometimes. So, so that's talk, all right. Talk with me about uh, not being a procrastinator if you have an issue, but you've got to be oh. the importance of being proactive. Talk with me about that. Oh, yeah, it is critically important. You know, I remember growing up and my mother saying, you snooze, you lose. Well, boy, that is really true when it comes to the RV business because their warranties have got these clauses in them that basically say if you're going to try to do anything legal about what's happening with your bad RV, there's time limits that they are imposing on you that are not normal. In the normal legal system, you get up to four years to file any kind of a claim over a breach of a warranty or a contract, typically anywhere. Well, these RV companies, for the most part, they're sticking in clauses that say you only got 90 days after your warranty expires or maybe 30 days. Yeah. And the problem is you take it in to get it worked on, and you may not get it back until the warranty's expired. So be proactive because that window of opportunity is, is, is shutting from the moment you buy the RV and take it off the lot. Yeah, it is. You really have to be careful about that, and you cannot wait until your warranty runs out to try to decide whether or not you need to do something. Because if you wait too long, they can just literally thumb their nose at you, and you're stuck with a bad RV. Uh, there's no way of knowing this, but I wonder how many RVers that buy a new RV actually read their warranty before they buy it. 
I'll bet you it's a very small percentage. I'm quite certain it is. In fact, uh, one of the things I always ask every client is, did you read the sales contract? And a lot of times they'll say yes. And then I say, now, wait a minute. Did you really read it? The whole thing. Did you read your warranty? The whole thing. Before you bought it or when you bought it. People don't like to admit that they trust and don't bother reading. But that's the reality of most people. Out of all these years, only once did I ever have anybody insist that they really did read it before they signed to buy it. Wow. What about, uh, I, I've heard a trick that, that people have been had pulled on them where uh, the dealer says, go ahead, I know we, we're going to order your parts, but you can take your, your RV and go ahead and use it and bring it back and then we'll fix it. Um, you know, take it back to the repair shop. Good idea or bad idea? Bad idea if you do it. Bad idea. And the reason is because one of the things that matters is the number of days that your RV is out of service. And the, those days count only when it's over there at the dealership, which is one of the reasons they want you to come take it. And then when you don't come take it, they blame you. Well, the real problem is you don't pay money so that you can own, use part of an RV. You pay the money to buy a new RV so you can use any part of it you want any time you want to use it. Well, in, in that uh, case that we just did last month in Pennsylvania, one of the things that was bad was that full wall slide out down one entire side of the RV. Mm -hmm. And in court, the factory representative actually told the jury that there, that really wasn't such a bad problem because they did have half of the RV they could use. Half of an what? RV? You, you, know, you have to make your whole payment. That went over like a lead balloon, didn't it? it oh, apparently yeah. it did. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it went over like a real lettered balloon. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I, I hate to bring this up, uh, even this scenario, but just if, if, for example, we were looking at a major downturn in the RV sector, in the RV industry, something similar, you know, I don't want this to happen, but what happened in 2008 or 2009, and someone had an RV that was made by a company that was going to file bankruptcy or did uh, go bankrupt or be sold, what happens to me, the RVer, with my, with my situation? If I've got a warranty on a on a travel trailer or whatever it happens to be, and the company goes bankrupt, your warranty goes bankrupt with it. You have no real meaningful legal rights at that point against the manufacturer, which is why it's so very very important to take a real hard look at making sure the sale happens in a way that gives you the most legal rights you can get. I've heard people buying, a, you know, getting a good uh, RV, getting a good buy on one from a dealer, and then the dealer literally going out of business six months later, and they have a claim they can't go after anybody. It's like going after a ghost, something that doesn't exist. Sometimes that's true, but that's one of the few examples of why sometimes you are better off letting the dealer set up the financing for you. Because when the dealer sets up the loan for you, even if it's with your own bank, it doesn't matter. If they set up the financing on that RV for you and you sign it at the dealership, federal law requires that finance contract to have a little clause in it that says that the bank is going to stand liable for whatever the dealer has done wrong. And that can save your, save your bacon. You know, uh, uh, I own a campground. My wife and I own a campground in, in uh, central Texas. And I mm -hmm. have, have some guests, that people that stay with us, they had a brand new uh, a Jayco Pinnacle fifth wheel, beautiful, beautiful unit, very happy. Mm -hmm. But they told me, they said, we almost didn't buy an RV because of you. And I said, I, I'm sorry to hear that. And then she said, no, 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 that's not true. We're glad because of you, because we took our time. They took their time to read paperwork, to ask oh, questions. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, I, it's a fine line I'm trying to walk because I am Mr. Happy. I do love RVing. I love RVers. I think most RVs are not lemons. But there's another side right. There's another side that's really ugly, and I just want to fight to protect people and arm them with knowledge. And, um, you know, I mean, you, you, get to, you get to defend these people every single day. That's your job. But I, anyway, I kind of digress. Well, the fact of the matter, though, Alan, is that you're right, you know, if – if you can warn people and if people understand and people take the time to read all that paperwork they're signing very carefully, they'll get a better understanding of what's going on. And then they can object to things they don't like or they can ask the dealer to write something in there that gives them some extra protection. Uh, you know, like the seven words we've talked about, things that people can do, but if they just rush right on through it and they get caught up in 
what dealers call the ether, where they're so excited they don't know for sure what the heck is going on, they can get ripped off so easy. Well, and, and doing what I suggest and you suggest is not fun. It's it's more fun to get caught up in the ether, it, to be intoxicated with the dreams and the fantasies of the purchase and all the things you're going to do. But that's mm-hmm. where people get they, that's where they get bit. They get hurt. You, you slow yeah. it down. There's plenty of time to enjoy that RV, but you better make sure do everything in your power to make sure you're getting a good one. Absolutely right. All right, so so we're going to wrap this thing up. Tell everybody about your website, Ron Burge, because I think it's it's probably the best uh, best place I know of where people can get lots and lots of information without spending a nickel. Ah, thank you, Alan. I appreciate that. But it is. It's been there for a long time, and we try to give away as much information as possible so that people can avoid the problems. Uh, but the website is just simply rvlemonlaw.com. And what I told that jury last month is what I tell every factory attorney. If you guys would just build these RVs right in the first place, I'd go back to writing wills. I love it. Listen, you are so good. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to to kind of enlighten us from time to time. And I look forward to doing it again. All right. Thank you, Alan. Good to talk. All right. You take care. All right, that is our buddy Ron Burge. I'm telling you, he is super smart. We are very lucky to have him on our side. He is the man that you never want to have uh, have to work with. But when you need a badass, I don't know of a, any RV lemon lawyer that's any better than Ron is. You can learn a lot more about lemon RVs and lemon law cases. Uh, contact your even contact information for your state's attorney general's office. Some email contact info, many of the big wigs at the manufacturer level, all on Ron's website at rvlemonlaw.com. That's rvlemonlaw.com. All right, that's going to do it for another After the Show show. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned a lot. Until next time, I'm Alan Warren, the RV Wingman, wishing you safe travels and great experiences. And finally, don't leave your good manners at home. So long, everybody. The R-